Hello, welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches. We're here to talk about time and how to spend it. My name is Felix Schultz, and I'm here with Andy Green. How are you going, Andy? Mate, I'm not uh, not too bad. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. We have a special guest coming on very, very shortly, uh, Patrick Johnson, otherwise known as P. Johnson, a uh, very famous international tailoring, I guess, a house. A man of style, a man of action, a man of leisure. He's right? a very, very a stylish. Uh, look, at the moment, I think so. Yeah, so t- uh, tell me a bit about what uh, old PJ's about. So they've been in the tailoring game for, I think, 10 years plus now they've got p johnson which is their made to measure offering they've mm-hmm. got suit shop which is a bit more i think off the rack yep okay so uh, so made to measure that's like i go in and get fitted and yep. but it's not full bespoke there's not no. old men with chalk all over me i mean depends what you're into but they are they've got i think they're made out of italy mostly yeah. now the the p johnson stuff like yep. it's 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 a really still quite good value yep. uh, and they've just launched or when i say just i'm not sure how recently but uh, p johnson year. femme yeah, so yeah, yeah. female made to measure suiting which is not it's, that it's common a, it's a tricky uh, tricky beast uh, it is old women suiting yeah look i think generally a lot of people avoid getting into that side of things so mm. no it's pretty cool and i think he's done that with the help of his wife well i think that's something we should we should chat about to him in a second is he a, is he a watch guy is he into his uh, old time pieces? yeah but i'll let him talk about that Oy. all right no spoilers oh you know what else we've got what bloody uh what's his name brad he's made a he's made a made a call oh wow yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah. okay cool yeah, all right yeah, well yeah. let's talk about that at the end right at the end all right we've got a bit of time before we call patrick so felix Yes. Tell me about something that you've uh, you've liked this week. Uh, look, let's be honest. Um, a few things I've liked. I was really tempted to go to RuPaul because I'm in isolation mm-hmm. at the moment, and I believe it's series twelve. I think currently on, and I'm. You're into twelve. Uh, I'm into all of them. I've mm. done all of them uh, and some of the the side shows, but I'm not going to talk about RuPaul because okay. uh, let's hold that off for the next All Star series. Um, <laughs> Two Instagram accounts I've gone with this two. week. Two related. Okay. Like there's, there's, there's the main one, which is Neon Talk, mm-hmm. and there's uh, the sort of more interior design product focus one, which is Concept Talk. Uh, what are they? Sorry? What are they? Well, they're basically uh, v- very visual lookbooky sort of stuff, like 80s, 90s aesthetic. So if you've... It's a pretty sort of a low bar for me because if you look at my Instagram stories, yep. any given day there's got to be some sort of neon ikea catalog from 1987 with something ridiculous or a you know a toyota corolla car interior Mm -hmm. from 1993 it's wild like it it makes you sort of realize how much design and style has in some ways changed in the not too big a time like you know you sort of let's go with the car example you look back at the 60s and 50s and people go wow we'll never make cars like that anymore you know that was the golden era of design but then you look at this I understand, you know, like the safety considerations, like you can't mm. make wings and fins that will be, you know, death traps on a car, but you, the choices of interior fabrics, like mm. who puts like lightning bolts, pink, t- you know, triangles and all on a fuchsia background. Legends like a, do. In a mainstream car release, it's 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 wacky. And um, so, so good, I, yeah, go. good inspiration for logos, maybe? Yeah, oh, let's be honest, they didn't show up on the mood board, but for me, it's it's it's... <laughs> It's cool. Like, I like the looks. You know, it's in right now, but I don't know about you. I'm a little bit older than you, I think. Mm. For me, I also every so often get, like, that deep, oh, I really remember that. Like, you know, I, I've... Not Nostalgia. Like I was, not like I was cool at the time, but it's like it's, you know, common day. Like, hey, I had those weird, you know, Nepalese print fur... You still wear that pads. stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm a hype beast. As um, does your son. So that's, I mean, that's really good for, you know inspo and scrolling through and seeing some of the wacky stuff yeah cool what about you andy what are you up to uh well ironically not related to fine tailoring but it's a sneaker shopping with complex high culture low culture boom 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 one two combo so complex is a a magazine slash media platform which i think uh some of you might have heard of complex is awesome complex is huge in the uh, in the states especially they do style pop sports music uh etc uh, yeah, right. Etc. Yeah. So they uh, they have a YouTube channel. They have a, a whole playlist series dedicated to what they've called sneaker shopping. I think it's up to like season nine. And yeah. basically, they've got the host who's Joe from Complex, mm-hmm. and he takes a you know a pretty high profile guest sneaker shopping. And look, they drop who a, who like high profile. Who are the who are your highlights? Who are the best guests? Oh, fabulous Eminem, Usain Bolt, Whoopi, Tony Hawk. Whoopi. Uh, yeah, Whoopi's huge. Oh, Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg. I didn't know if that was like a, a cool, like maybe some sort of YouTuber. Or oh, no, like, no, no, no. It's, it's like, it's proper A-list. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
you know, all of the look, and it's not everyone that you would think in terms of like rappers, R and B musicians. Mm-hmm, There's mm-hmm. some interesting kind of people in the mix. Yeah. So it's really interesting to see these these guys go in and and hear their stories and and the way that kind of sneakers influence their life one way or another. And they're not all kind of like hard sneakerheads. Like I'm not really into sneakers at all, but I just yeah. find it fascinating hearing like why Kevin Hart you know, relate so much to like an Air Jordan or something like that. It's that same sort of, I mean, for me, like I'm in a similar position to you. I'm not a, you know, super into sneakers. Mm. It's that sort, It's adjacent to watches. Yeah. That's what I like. I can find something relatable in anyone that has like a real deep passion about a, a product or a thing. Totally. You know, it can be cars or cameras or art or, you know, I think there's that, the, the passion comes through. Definitely, and it's it's interesting. Obviously, you have like a lot of athletes and musicians that probably started off quite poor, aspiring to own like a hundred and fifty dollar mm. pair of Nikes or something, mm. and now they go in and they can drop like twenty grand. And you can look at it as obnoxious, but you can also look at it as like, wow, these guys like there was a point in life where you know they were wearing like fake sneakers. Their mum could barely put food on the table, mm. and look where they are now. So there's a fair bit of inspiration kind of in the mix yeah, as it's well. Earned. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. It, you know context matters. So you know. yeah. And, and, and it's just cool to see the, the styles that they like and the different sort of shoes that people are into. So was there one you, – you've just been getting on the season or is there any particular sort of standouts from the recent one that you've – I go in and out. Uh, I just watched Lil Wayne who oh – yeah, nice. it, I'm amazed that the guy's still around, still making music, still relevant. Uh, yeah. Good for him. So – He's a, he's a dude. Uh, yeah. It's just fun to watch. Like it's not hard. It's it's enjoyable. That's what we want. That's what we want in these uh, you know these times. So I think it's time to go from sneakers to suiting. Yeah, nice. Should we give Patrick oh, that's a call? A question: Can he wear sneakers with a suit? I don't know. I'm not that cool. Let's ask. All right, let's do it. All right, let's get him on the line. All right. Hello. G'day, Patrick. It's Andy Green here. How you going, mate? I'm well. Good. Good to hear. You're here with our, our co-host Felix Schultz. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Hey, I'm well. Where have we caught you this morning? I'm actually in at work um, in our showroom in Paddington, just knocking off a few things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. And so it, let's uh, let's talk about your work, P. Johnson. So we, I started. I was living in London and started this business when I came back to Australia about ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little over ten years ago, um, and we're a, we're a, we're a tailoring business, and we have showrooms in Melbourne and Sydney and one in New York, which we've had for about five years, and one in London we've had for about two years. And we have a workshop in Tuscany where we have about 60 people wow. who make uh, yeah who make a lot of our tailoring there. And, yeah, we, we're a custom, we, make, we make custom clothing, everything from sort of dinner wear to business suiting all the way through to casual wear, technical outerwear. We don't, we don't, we don't focus on making things, um, making things custom made. And we also have we also have a women's line as well, uh, which we introduced about uh, eight months ago, um, which is focused on women's tailoring, but a little bit more casual, not so corporate women's tailoring, a little bit more casual. So yeah, we've got about forty odd in Australia in our retail team, and uh, then New York and, and, and London as well. Um, yeah. Wow. So you really built a global brand over the last you know five to ten years. Especially. I mean, yeah, we're pretty we're pretty wet. I mean. We're, we're, we're pretty small, but um, it's a pretty it's a pretty tight knit little team. But um, but just you know, slowly, slowly is our, our kind of uh, our kind of plan um, here. And um, yeah, we opened in New York. That was the first outpost we opened outside of Australia. And we were going to New York for about two years before doing funk show, seeing mm-hmm. our clients there. And then from that demand, we slowly opened. And we also and then the same in London. We also operate in Jakarta. We, we've been going there for about seven years and looking to do something a little bit more permanently there probably next year now. I think this year's a, bit, a little bit of a write-off. Yeah. Uh, and we do, we, yeah, we do the same in Malaysia, in, in Kuala Lumpur, um, Singapore, and then around America. But, yeah, I mean, we, we just have a focus on in, in our business on helping – we're really focused on building wardrobes in a way that's sustainable and helping our clients build that foundation of their – Classic, more classic wardrobe. Really, we're sort of um, focused in that area, and um, how yeah, how can we do that in a sustainable, waste-free way? Nice, um, Patrick. Now that you, you sort of you've gone through the laundry list of uh, you know quite a global operation, I was wondering, do you think there's is there quite a regional element in what you see your clients getting in different locations, or is it at the sort of the style that you're offering? Is it is it all the same? Well, it definitely it definitely varies. I mean, it, it kind of has to. You know, our client in New York, 
has a different sort of life and, and, and working environment and situation to our client in Australia. There, there are some fundamentals we, we, we kind of focus on. Comfort's a big one for us. We, mm. we kind of look first at comfort and looking and feeling comfortable in your clothing. And we're, we're a specialist lightweight tailor, so our, our construction is generally a little bit lighter than the, than the classic sort of, say, Savile Row suit, a um, little bit softer. And that's just because that's the way we like to wear clothing in that way, that it's a bit unconscious and feels a bit... We always say, like, you're wearing pyjamas, you should be able to sort of forget about the clothing once you put it on. But yeah, nice. our clients in New York, definitely, I mean, you've got sort of... You've got the you know the different seasons to think of over there, which we don't um, which we don't have to think about. We don't have to think about as much here. You know the intense winters, but also you know you can you can dress up for business a little bit more in in, in, in a city like New York and a city like London, where uh, in, in Australia sometimes dressing that formally all the time feels a little bit out of place. But you know, it's saying that you know our clients in Australia they're traveling so much mm. that they're that it, it is becoming less less kind of. Uh, Less different in the different spaces. Yeah, there's definitely differences. Uh, you know, our clients in Jakarta, for instance, it is a little bit more casual there in business, but they'll they'll offer a lot of linens and a lot of cottons and, and, and things like this. And they've also got we do a lot of evening wear there, and they've got their traditional sort of batik kind of evening wear as well, which we incorporate in. So that's something a little bit different. But that's one of the great things about our business and, and what we get to do. We get to dress that like Upper East Side New York guy that I kind of grew up kind of looking at the way these guys dressed and thinking that's amazing. We get to dress those guys and we get, get dressed guys in London and in Europe and then throughout Asia and you, you learn so much from from this process. Fantastic. I think you, you guys have been around just about as long as I've been working full time and definitely P. Johnson was one of those inspirational and aspirational brands to own as sort of an 18, 19 year old graduate when I started out in a former accounting career <laughs> and and it's it's certainly an iconic look within Australia like you kind of can tell the soft shoulders and the the casual sort of approach to suiting which I really like but you also have suit shop right yeah I mean we have we have three levels inside of P. Mm. Johnson so when I started actually back here I started the, we started the company under the name suit shop and the idea was to have any sort of uh, pretense or any uh, intimidation around the whole process of, of, of getting something made by a tailor and getting dressed and thinking about clothing for men you know Aussie men are pretty generally pretty relaxed and but can get a little bit intimidated around the whole clothing process so I wanted to keep it pretty open and, and get rid of all the pretense and stuff like that so I started a suit shop and then as, as it kept on going we, we sort of changed the name to P. Johnson but we kept the suit shop line in our business as our entry level line and we have three levels of suit shop mm-hmm. Pronto Pronto is our middle level uh, and then we have uh, P. Johnson which is Satoria Carrara which is made in our, our workshop in Tuscany so it's just for us it really was a way to kind of be accessible to a wider a wider base you know like we have some clients that can afford to buy suits two thousand two and a half thousand dollars but there's some that can't and i believe that you can have a lot of value in a suit around the thousand dollar mark there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's made in the right way and made and sold for the right price so we wanted to we wanted to offer be able to offer uh, at all those levels in, in our aesthetics so we split it by by that name we kept that name going for a bit of a legacy kind of thing yeah, fantastic. And for the people that still might want to, you know, buy a suit, whether it's a, a suit shop or a P. Johnson, can they still do that? Are, you, are your showrooms still open? Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, we're we we have to um, we have to sort of uh, abide by the government social mm-hmm. distancing uh, recommendations. Um, for our current clients, we're doing a lot of consults uh, via via sort of WhatsApp, via video link, and via via those kind of things. And our, our showrooms are only really open for current clients to come and pick up kit. But we're also for, for new clients. We are doing we're doing um, online kind of fittings uh, with these guys. So you you kind of you plug in with one of our tailors. We send you a little kit, and you plug in one of our tailors on a video call, and we kind of talk to the fit and the cut that you kind of want. And mm. we we've been doing that to be honest for a very long time because we do a lot of sort of say weddings are an, an example where you get a groomsman that he might be in, you know, far North Queensland or something and we're not going there. And so we've been doing this for a long time where we'll send them a little kit of how to kind of measure yourself, but then we get online with them and, and talk them through how to do it. So we do that, but yeah, it's uh, definitely, um, we're not as easy. It's not, a, it's not as sort of open as we were, but let's hope that that doesn't sort of stay forever. And on a sort of a, re- a related note, I, I suspect this is something you've got uh, opinion on working from home, uniforms hmm. uh where you know are you sort of just dress what's comfortable uh you know sort of maybe 
dress up more to make yourself feel like you're not just at home 24-7? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it depends on the day, right, how you feel. <laughs> you kind of, some days you feel like you really want to, want, to, want to dress up and some days you kind of just want to be comfy. But I kind of, I'm not, a re- I'm not much of a sort of stay at home in trappies kind of kind of guy, but um, you have to also dress for the environment. So we, I'm, I've got a home office at home. It's sort of a building just outside of the main house. It used to be our garage and my wife's converted it into a home office. So I'll kind of get dressed up to go there, but I'm not really wearing a tie. I'm sort of more just, you know, wear a jacket because that's, that's what I feel comfortable in. That's probably, do you have a daily uniform then that, that you normally wear? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now I'm kind of, yeah, it, it kind of varies from day to day. I mean, right now I'm wearing a lot of denim. We, we started mm. this custom made denim line, this Japanese denim line a while ago. So I wear I wear jeans and then a nice sort of oxford button down and then I wear a blazer with it and then a, a pair of sort of sand shoes, what I call sand shoes or a pair of loafers or something like that. Um, I put a suit on yesterday. And, and, and sort of came into work but a really nice uh, casual kind of cotton suit it was really nice weather here yesterday and I wore that with a polo shirt um, and a pair of our driving shoes uh, I don't know mate today I'm wearing like a full caftan top with a pair of jeans and a pair of sneakers I look, I look pretty weird like I'm doing some kind of cult or something like that but you know kind of I, I, I enjoy like whether it's in are you dressing whether you're stuck in quarantine at home or you're going to work like I enjoy the process of getting dressed and I'm kind of, it hasn't much, not much has sort of changed for me day to day. You kind of um, just dressing up in sort of how you feel and, and uh, sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. <laughs> yeah, totally. Now you're a, you're a very, very stylish man yourself and you feature a little bit on the uh, P Johnson socials. I've noticed. I've also noticed. Yeah, it's, uh, cheap, it's, cheap, it's, a, it's, it's cheaper than paying a model, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's true also. <laughs> So you don't invoice for that for your appearance fees? No, no, I, I do it. I do it. It's, it's good for my ego. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you have model on your LinkedIn. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a flashy. Yeah, oh, nice, definitely. Nice. Lovely. Yeah. But I have noticed a quite a special piece on your wrist. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of that that uh, you mean my uh, my my tech. Of course. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a funny story that because I um I've always loved watches, but. Sort of for the for me, a Patek, like you know, it was always been that watch that I, I kind of really wanted. My father had one growing up. My great aunt gave him wow. absolutely stunning, super super thin Patek, and he wore that every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, we got broken into uh, on a, on the farm. Uh, I think when I was sort of about fourteen, fifteen, and the watch got stolen. Uh, he he did wear it every day, apart from when he was actually doing manual labour. But um, but. He lost that, and then I was. It was my wife's thirtieth birthday, uh, six, five, six years ago, mm. and I was looking for a watch for her to, to buy for her thirtieth. And uh, in that process of looking, I ended up finding myself <laughs> finding myself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know. Um, and uh, and I love it. I wear it every single day. It's a really nice size, and it's only 30, 35 mil, which is currently mm. like you know in, in the current market is perceived to be quite a small watch for a man, but. Um, you know, tradition pre kind of two thousand, it was not 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 that crazy a size, um, and it's it's really great. You wear it as an everyday watch. I've had to re- replace the rubber strap about three times because they do go over time, and okay. you can find them quite easy. You can find them quite easily online, um, and yeah, it's two, it's nineteen ninety nine. It was one of the last sort of years where they actually did the uh, the yellow gold and, yep. and and that size after after the GSC they they got into the rose gold a bit more and got a little bit bigger. So we'll, um, we'll paint a, a visual picture for the listeners who haven't uh, peeped yet, but it's a, it's a Patek Philippe Aquanaut reference. Is it a 5066? Yeah, I think, I think you're right, yeah. I think I'm right. Okay. And it's uh, yellow gold on a rubber That's, strap. That is a strong flex. Smaller yellow gold so, Aquanaut. Nice. And you're wearing a rubber strap with a suit every day. Yeah, I do. I mean, I've, I've got... Well, I've got sort of three or four watches, but mm-hmm. that's the one that I wear pretty much all the time. Um, and I wear that. I don't generally wear it with evening wear, although I, I wouldn't like not wear it with evening wear. But I've got a watch. I've got a nineteen thirty. I think it's a nineteen thirty six uh, Jaeger uh, Reverso yeah, um, cool. that my wife got me for my 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 thirtieth. And I usually wear that for evening wear. But I don't love wearing uh, leather straps every day. Okay. Um, I much I much for metal or rubber, so yeah, I'll wear that pretty much every day. Um, that watch, uh, the, the Aquanaut, and uh, 
it, it's amazing. Like this, I mean, it's a Patek, so they're beautifully built, but it actually like it keeps perfect time. Still, I've had a service once, which was mind-bogglingly expensive to get done. But um, it's uh, it's really it's, yeah, it's a really easy watch to wear with casual with suiting. It's just got its own strong personality. It, it, so it doesn't it doesn't really you don't really have to justify it too much with different outfits. It kind of cuts through pretty well on its own. You, you said just something before that I, I, you know, sort of found quite interesting as a watch uh, person. Um, there's a lot of sort of r- rules around what what sort of watches you should wear. Like you, sh- you know, you shouldn't wear uh, rubber with a suit. You, you know, we don't wear a sports watch with a tuxedo. All this sort of stuff. Um, and you've just sort of said, I wear, you know, I don't really like leather bands. Is that? Mm. Uh, is that mostly because you're based in Australia and the, you, the the climate, or are there other sort of aspects at play there? Yeah, it is. I mean, you're right. Firstly, on the rules side of things, it's the same in dressing, right? In, in, in tailoring, there's all these rules. But I always find with these, like, some of them are good guidelines, but mm. generally they're put in place. They're generally put in place by people who kind of don't get the concept that, like, we're all so different. We can all these rules are there to be actually broken and they should be. And when you've got the confidence to do it, you can do it in the right ways. Like to say like you shouldn't, you should only wear a leather, a, a leather, a leather strap watch with a suit is, is a ridiculous. Well, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. But, um, but I, I basically, because I swim every single day and I like to put my watch on in the morning and I take it off at night. And so I can't put the leather strap in the water, mm. but also like, I actually, the humidity under my wrist the whole time, it kind of gets a little bit agitated. It gets a bit funky. Uh, on, on a leather strap. Yeah. yeah, well, I just like, I get a bit of a rash underneath the strap, basically. It's just a yeah. technical concern. Oh I love God. the look. Like, my favorite watch, which I, I, um, I can't, which I, which, I, which I love to own one day, is the Cartier, you know, the Crash? Oh, oh nice. Yeah. It's like my, like, all time favorite, like, watch, and I love it, but it's like, you know, leather strap, you'd maybe wear it with evening wear. Um, yeah. Did kind you, of thing a little bit see, more. Um, uh, Kim and Kanye got matching crashes. Yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah, that's there a, you a go. Pretty solid move. It's a big flex, and those are that's very. A, it, it, it's, just a, it's a beautiful watch, though. Like it, it's very like yeah. It's I, I'm I'm surprised that they went for it, but that that's cool. That's cool that they did that. It's a very very expensive and very hard to find watch when you start looking yeah, for a crash. They're... Yeah. Yeah, they're super expensive. I've got a, a, a client of mine who desperately wants one, and we talk about watches the whole time. And I'm constantly looking on um, Chrono Twenty Four to see to see. There's one there now, but it's the it's the one with that weird dial. It's just not not, not great. But anyway, I, I mean, I, I think I'd probably wear that a little bit <laughs> if I had it. But, okay. Cool. Um, but I wear I wear I like that, and I like rubber. Like I've got a, a Tiger Heuer F One, which That's is like not a partic- which is not a particularly like you know expensive watch or anything like that. But I wear that a lot. Like when I'm on holiday especially if i'm fishing or you're doing stuff that's like a lot more active you know the protect's great but actually if you're exercising and stuff like that you shouldn't really wear it it's, a little bit more careful not amazing for it. yeah it's actually just not amazing for it like but the tag is, is i wear that and then i wear my wife's rolex a little bit which is a with a day just which i'm wearing today which nice. is a you know got the sil- silver and gold with the black face um but yeah yeah it's kind of kind of that's just a great thing about watches it's like it's like getting dressed to me it kind of depends on your mood very you know, cool. you can kind of, and you can manipulate an outfit. If you're wearing a really classic, like navy blue suit in a really classic way, sometimes having a watch that kind of jumps out a little bit, it's quite nice. You can hide it when you need to, or you can kind of pull it out if you want to want to add something. Yeah, true. Very cool. So we've uh, we've spotted uh, your watch. Have you spotted any watches on the wrist of clients over the years that have really spoken to you or stood out? Well, the, Aqu- the Aquanaut was actually one that I did spot on the wrist of the okay. client initially. Um, client of mine in Sydney is a really cool guy. And he had one, and I was like, "Man, I just I love your watch. Like, it's really, really beautiful." And he, he kind of talked me through it. And he's, he's an older guy. I've, tried, I've seen loads. Yeah, I kind of like. I mean, I've got a group. I've got you know groups of clients that are really just have the, have amazing watch collections. You know, where you kind of constantly just oh, wow. Every time you see them, they're kind of wearing Something a piece different. of watch, which is which is amazing. Um, that's, but that's... yeah, I've seen I've seen a few. I love the. I saw a client the other day. Really cool. He's actually an Italian. A client, he's an Italian guy, um, and lives in London, and he's wearing the Rolex. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't pull this off. But you know the Florentine? Have you seen that? The all gold, pretty full on. Yeah. It's amazing. It's it's like so. And he's like, what would he be like? Sixty mid sixties. He's just and it's just and it's amazing. a seriously. It's like a it's a pretty full on statement, but he just looks so cool. Nice. Like it's like it's like I think it was like a. 
you know, eighteen karat gold presidential, but it's that Florentine kind of strap and that kind of oh, that right, kind right. of effect that that gets. Yeah, it's, it's it's super super chic, and that, that's like a watch. Like he looks so cool, and not many people can pull that off. Um, like you literally look like a drug dealer, most yeah. guys. If you wear that, but a, he's like just a dope old Italian dude. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. They're, they're super important. Like I know you know Italy's obviously sort of you know fashion capital number one or two, but it's the same for watches. Like what the Italians were doing everything cool fifteen years before anyone at else, least. You know, yeah, it's massive. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like all all the best watches that I see. Like we've we, our workshops in Tuscany uh, in a place called Massa Carrara, but it's the closest big town's Pisa. But there's a really lovely town near there that I usually stay at when I go to the workshop called Pietra Santa, and in that little town, there's a vintage watch dealer and he always has like the best watches. So you're like, what the hell is that? It's like, he had this amazing AP in there last time I went in there. I was like, that's the coolest AP I've ever seen. It was solid gold, quite small, quite thin. It was just like so chic. And he's like, yeah, this one. And they're like, they're not like, some of these watches aren't the ones that are like crazily collectible or crazily yeah, expensive, sure. but they're just so chic. Give them five years. Um, a yeah, exactly. And these guys, like, I love those little, there's, there's a really nice little one in Parma as well, uh, in Italy that I always go to and it's got the coolest, like, beautiful old, old Rolex. Because I saw an amazing um, tapestry dial president, you know, the Rolex, the, 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 the day date yeah, yeah, yeah. in gold. It's like, it's the first time I've seen that tapestry. I've seen, yeah. I've seen it, like, online, like, when you yeah. see things. First, it, it's like, the coolest fucking watch as well. Yeah, right. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. something you said before was that you sort of um, you share a watch with your uh, with your wife, which I think is very cool. I mm. think you know it sort of doubles the the wearing potential. I just wanted to have a chat um, a little bit about um, your women's line and where that sort of came from, because that's a, a seldom travelled path in in tailoring. suiting and tailoring, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of, I mean, we've had a, a few requests over the years, probably the most common requests is we get is from our clients, wives or partners or women in general that say, okay, hey, can you make can you make a suit? And we, we had made quite a few on our men's block in a man's style of suiting. Um, and I kind of thought, you know, it's not really what I want to do for women's suiting. I wanted to create a line of suiting for women that was very feminine. It was a woman suit for woman, not a man suit for woman. Mm. Um, and it can be worn in that same way that we try and dress our men, which is in this kind of casual, like, you know, very comfortable kind of way um, and with elegance and all these kind of things. Um, so we worked, I worked on this project it took sort of about two and a half, three years in the making to get it right because it's not a prescribed format for women in tailoring like there is men. You know, with men's tailoring, it's sort of certain as I was talking about the rules before, but there's a certain format to stick mm. inside of. Uh, and you can go outside of that format a little bit and stuff like that, which is cool. But with the women, there's no format, right? So it's completely open. So we had to sort of create our own format that we wanted to establish a framework with um, and kind of go from there. So it's been really good fun. Like it, 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 it's, been, it's, been, it's been a really amazing process. But to be able to offer women what we offer our men, which is you know this idea that they can come in and design this wardrobe for themselves with us uh, and hopefully get a bit more value out of their wardrobe and, and get a lot more wear out of their pieces. And um, it's, it's been really, really good fun. So, so far we've got tailoring, you know, jackets and trousers and we have, uh, we've done quite a few different models of shirts. So like little baseball shirts, uh, little casual silk shirts, some overcoats as well. And yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And um, it's been a nice addition also to our showroom. So we've got separate areas in each showroom for the women. Um, to kind of keep it a little bit more private for the women when they're shopping because it can be quite intimidating if you're coming into one of our showrooms on a weekend and there's like, you know, 30 men who are very familiar with the process of getting stuff tailor-made and it's quite new to you. So uh, we got these little areas, but it's been it's been really cool and the uptake's been pretty seamless um, with our staff. They're, they absolutely love it. And then also just um, just with our, with, our, with our customer base. So it's quite exciting. And then we also got, you know, with women – the fabrics are quite different that you can look at and do. You've got a little bit of a different thing. So we develop with our men's weavers lots of new weaves and, 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 and new finishes on fabrics to use with the women's, which is which has been exciting too. So yeah, it's really, really, really enjoyable. Yeah, that's really interesting that you say that and we're talking about sharing because I've, I've I first heard about the women's uh, line from a from a mate of mine who got dragged down to your Melbourne showroom with his wife and I think she was picking up a, a, a navy suit and he ended up kind of 
getting a pair of a pair or two of trousers but he was uh he was stoked but she was even happier because uh, i don't think that there's a th- that many options for women out there in terms of the more bespoke more made to measure tailoring yeah there's not i mean i think i think the classic thing is like without like listen when, when male tailors generally do women they just do it with a they do it like a man's first woman right and mm. i think generally that's pretty that's pretty ugly like mm. Yeah, super, super, like it's just generally not. It's not how I kind of think women should dress, uh, and, and what they're going to feel comfortable with longer term. So that's been the issue so far. But um, you know, there's a few people kind of popping and coming through. But we wanted to look at it less as suiting and more as clothing for women. Like we're doing, like you know, little skirts and dresses and all these things custom made for women that they can incorporate in a little bit of knitwear and things like this as well, which we have in the pipeline. Um, so just yeah, looking at that women's wardrobe and thinking like, what's the best kind of way that we can, we can kind of help you dress in that um, basically slightly classical format. But um, it's cool. Like, it, it, it's, it's definitely been a learning curve for us, but we've gone into it quite slowly. And um, it's, been, it's, been really, uh, it's been really interesting. Yeah, amazing. So what is the, I mean, typical timeline for someone looking to, you know, pick up a suit, jacket, pants? Yeah, it's around it's around sort of five to six weeks. Uh, it depends a little bit on the time of year um, and you know, global kind of um, viral epidemics mm. and things like pandemics and things like that. But it's generally sort of five to six weeks. You have your first fitting and everything. You come back to your next fitting, and we have a we have in house uh, team of of, um, of tailors who adjust everything on, on our premises. Okay. Uh, in all our, our city showrooms, actually, we we take it back to the main showroom, but. In, even in London and in, in, in um, New York, we have everyone on site. So that uh, on site. So that's pretty quick. That process. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, on this uh, this obviously global pandemic that we're all going through together, you have you mentioned to me that you've been um, doing something kind of to help out on your end. Oh uh, yeah, I mean we've been we, we we were quite we were quite early on in this pandemic like felt uh, this pandemic quite early on because we have manufacturing in China and in Italy. Yeah. Um, and when our Chinese workshop first, like, they kind of made us aware of this and they're like, yeah, this is happening, they started two lines, one line making face masks and one line making protective clothing wow. as well. Um, so we, by the time this came to Italy and we're starting to feel the effects there, we are ready and they shared all that know-how with us and um, all the patterns and everything and what we need to do. So we started making predominantly face masks in our, in our workshop in Italy. Um, and we were just doing that as a side line inside the factory while we we're still making suiting. And then, as the as it got worse in Italy, we just transferred pretty much the whole workshop over into making face masks. And we're doing about seven, eight thousand a day wow. at the moment, which isn't. I mean, it's not crazy numbers, but it's you know, it's it's That's kind small. of enough supply. Yeah, it's enough for us to supply the local hospital um, and keep them in masks, which is good. And then we've also through our kind of network of manufacturing, we've got some other masks um, kind of in production and we're doing a little bit locally as well you know, in Australia, but trying to get, um, trying to just get a, a sort of enough enough going to where we can help. And then one of our clients in New York is a, he's a chef there, Gakko Mario Carbone. Wow. Um, he's got Carbone and he's a lovely guy. And he reached out and said, listen guys, can you help? Because the local hospital in Queens where he's from, like they literally don't have any masks left. Crazy. So we started sending some masks to New York, um, and that's become a little bit complicated now because I think you get five years in jail if you send masks from Australia uh, outside of Australia now. So we're, we're trying to find a way we can get more masks. We get another shipment coming from them, but we're going to we're trying to use our. You know, we also manufacture and um, we do things in Poland, we do things in Spain, we do things all around. So just getting our manufacturing network together and saying, hey, where can we kind of push supply? Of these kind of things, so no, it's been, listen, it's been a yeah, an inch, uh, interesting project to work on. I mean, I think there's an old saying about when you get lemons, you make lemonade, yeah, sure. and that's kind of my approach on it. You gotta, you gotta, gotta go for it. But on the other side, you know, we've got 60 people in Mass Carrara. Like, we've mm. got to make sure these guys still have work to do. Um, mm. We had to send send home the people who'd be worst affected uh, and kind of things, and 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 put them sort of in, into isolation. So we've got some older workers there and people with respiratory issues. But the workshop's still going and it's keeping them keeping them making money. Um, I mean, they don't make they don't make much, just enough to basically cover the actual cost of making them. But it's, you know, the important thing is, is you guys would be aware, it's like we've got to make sure everyone's got a job at the end of this. So that's the other side of this mass production is actually just keeping people in work and keeping people busy and 
yeah, it's been uh, it's been interesting, but um, hopefully we can we can um, sort of ramp that production up a little bit in Australia. But um, we'll see. One last question for you, and it's a two parter. Um, what would you sort of suggest to someone as the if you were going to get one suit or one piece of sort of more tailored clothing? What should you get? And to go with that, one watch. Well, that's a, I mean that's a hard question because we're all you know, we're all so different. But um, if you're thinking about a male, a man, uh, we'll, start, we'll start there. That might make yeah, it a bit easier. But that. listen, if you're going to have one suit in your wardrobe, you you you'd probably start with a navy blue mm. suit. And for a number of reasons, especially, you know, you can wear the jacket as a separate jacket. You can wear it as a pair of jeans. You can wear it as a pair of sort of casual trousers, that navy blazer. But the navy suit is that kind of backbone of of, of the male wardrobe, and it's got a lot of versatility in it. So I, I'd, I'd recommend to go for a navy suit. I mean, and how you set that up and the style is more sort of the you, yep. a little bit on your kind of shape and, 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 and stuff, but also on, on your personality, whether you go for a double-breasted or a single-breasted kind of suit, um, they, all could, they all could work really, really well. Something that's really comfortable and reasonably lightweight and a trans-seasonal fabric, you know, around the sort of 250 to sort of 300 grams. Nice. And I, 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 go, I go for a wool um, over, over a cotton or a linen because um, it's just, it's really versatile and it, you know, it's really good for travel and it, 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 it's trans-seasonal. So yeah, navy na- navy suit for a guy. Uh, I think I think is uh, is um, is probably the good sort of one thing to go for if, if, if you're only going to go for one, and that that'll help build that down, a solid foundation in that classic wardrobe. One watch is a really hard one because what's, what's the equivalent uh, of a navy blue suit for a, for a guy in a watch? Oh God, I think it, I think that's hard. I mean, you know, like. Some would say a Rolex Submariner is mm. that equivalent. Not a cheap that suit at the moment, but I kind of I, I find it. I find watches are so dependent on the wearer's personality, like I just and their condition. Like if you're going to rock a gold Rolex, like you, sometimes that can be inappropriate <laughs> in, in certain office environments, kind of thing. But I think there's a few different ones. I mean, I, I think a really classic kind of Cartier tank is like a beautiful, beautiful watch to wear. That if you're wearing a leather strap watch, like I bought my my father one for his seventieth, my brother, my sister, and I did. It's like beautiful. He wears it every day. It's perfect on him. He wears a little bit of jewelry, but it's really, really classic. Uh, I think that's a beautiful option as a watch. I mean, I'm not. You know, I grew up. My, my stepfather always wore a sub, wore a Submariner, mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. It's kind of old and a bit beat up. I'm not a massive fan of like brand new Submariners. I don't know why. Maybe just because I've, you see quite a lot of them around, and they're quite a sort of a bit of a status kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of think the plain ones, but um, my, maybe in the minority there. It's a, it's a really hard question. I, I kind of. I guess there's no right answer, and I'm I'm with you on the uh, on yeah. The beat I mean, up I get it. I. Yeah, I get this a lot with like with you know when you're chatting to mates about they're thinking about getting their first. Well, like one of my good mates is a he's a photographer in London. He's got a lot of a lot of personality, right? Like there's a guy called James Harvey Kelly. He shoots a lot of our stuff and shoots all of Ralph Lauren's. Now most of Ralph Lauren's photo shoots and stuff like that. So he's like he's got a lot of character, and we're kind of like going through like what's his. I was going through with him, what's his watch. Like he doesn't really have. He didn't really have like you know he was just wearing swatch watches up until now, and sort of went through his long sort of process with him. What's the, what's the, what's the best kind of watch for him? And he's like he's a guy with you know he's got a fair bit of character. He dresses reasonably flamboyantly. But he's like, this is a watch he wants to wear every single day, right? And he's traveling. I mean, right now he's not traveling, obviously, but yeah. he's traveling like 95% of the time. He needs something that's going to be quite durable. Um, and so he went for the Rolex Day Day in a 36 mil with a, the, a full 18 carat gold with a black style. No, that's perfect. The and 36 mil is perfect. Suits, it, it suits. Yeah, it suits him so perfectly because when you meet dresses, like he wear a suit sometimes, but he wear it in quite a casual way, and he's got he's got really really good stuff. Like he'll go through that, and he'll wear that really 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 well, and that you know he can get away with that. And I think watches more so in a way than clothing is really dependent on your on your sort of situation and and also on your personality. Like really really dependent. If you're a subtle person, you want to go go something quite subtle. Then don't you know don't go for a gold watch, right? Go to something a little bit more kind of filled up. But that's a really good question. I find that one hard. I mean, what about you guys? What do, what do you guys think is the perfect kind of starting starting watch? Well, well, well it's a great watch. question. Back to us. We actually, as part of this podcast, we uh, we have a bit of a watch matchmaking service where our listeners can write in and kind of give us a bit of a brief around their budget, the stuff that they own, the stuff that they like, and because it is such a unique uh, experience and sound of personal taste, we we basically approach each person individually. 
uh, same with suiting, same with, you know, what, what you're saying now. If I had to answer gun, gun to my head, then, oh, yeah, I think it's going to be like a vintage, vintage sub for me. Oh, yeah, I think you've nailed it on yeah. as well. Like a, a modern sort of sporty dive watch covers a lot of bases, I think. You can do a lot with it, same as a, a nice blue suit. Mm. Yeah, I, lo- I love the vintage subs. They've just got they've just got that a bit more elegance to them than the new ones, which are a bit too industrial and a bit too chunky, kind of clunky for me. Mm. Yeah, they're quite chunky. Yeah, I did get into like I was going through the client the other day, and he's he's a pretty cool guy. Like he's kind of a little bit older, and we're going through sort of gold watches. Like yeah, and he's not hyper wealthy kind of guy as well. He's like, listen, I want to get a gold watch, but I don't want to go. I don't want to get another Rolex, and mm. I don't want to get anything too flashy. Like. And we, we, we have a pretty good back and forth and we send each other like messages about watches quite often. And I ended up getting in, into the Piaget Polo, you know, the original one. Ooh, wow. Strong it's, I, and I, I've always, I've, I've always been fascinated by them because it's that kind of like 80s, 70s, so 80s Wall Street kind of guy. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by them and I haven't really seen too many of them on, on people, but a client of mine in New York had one and I was like, it, uh, it was amazing. And so this client here got one and it looks so cool. Wow. Like, he's, it, it, it's so chic. Like, it's, it's one of the early, early ones. But I think yeah. they, they got a bit, they got a bit rounded hmm. a couple of years in and it was one of the ones and it's just so chic and so elegant. And for a gold watch, you actually, when it's on him, it actually looks, it actually looks pretty tough, not, not, not flashy. It was, it was nice. It's nice as did. But that's what, I mean, he can pull that off, right? That guy, like, there's not many people that can pull that watch off. So, yeah. Lovely. That's a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic watch. Uh, look, mate, cautious of the time. Thank you so much for, for chatting to us. We really appreciate it. And we'll uh, link up all your details in the show notes of, as well. Cool, guys. Take care. Look after yourself. It's been a pleasure. You too. You too, mate. Stay safe. See you, guys. See you, mate. You too, well, Felix, that was a great chat with, uh, with Patrick. He's a fascinating guy. Loves his watches. And if you want to check him out, it's at P. Johnson Taylors. Patrick Johnson, that's his name. He's his name's Patrick. Yeah. PJ. Uh, so give uh, Patrick Johnson Taylors a, a search and check him out. Or just go to at P. Johnson Taylors. Yes, the Instagram. correct Instagram handle. Nice. Well done. That'll help. Really interesting question you had around watch rules. Yeah, I think that's sort of the, you know, uh, and, uh, and he nailed it. Like when he sort of said it's what, it's a sort of a general guideline, but you can, you know, to once you master the rules, you can break them. Mm. Which and, and that got me thinking: Do you have a sort of wrist-related style or wearing rules? Hard and fast rules. Uh, look, probably the only only thing I'm cautious of is rubber straps and when I wear them. So, okay. in the workplace, generally not. Uh, but everything else, I think, is is in play. Fair play, Patrick. But, but Patrick, he made a really good point about. So he he wears that rubber yeah. rubber Aquanaut all, all all day, and he's. I totally get that. If it's got to go with your whole life, yes. Like you don't want to be, especially something like that. You don't want to take it off when you go to the beach, or you know. Don't get me like wrong. I definitely do wear rubber straps at work. I just don't feel amazing about it. And I'm going oh. to give the Aquanaut a bit of a a special rule because that is a very very nice rubber strap. Yeah, and it sort of goes. It's made for it, I guess. It's so. got that texture to it, like that waffle texture. Uh, Would you wear like some sort of? Um, so what is it about rubber that you're not into? I, I think it's just the idea, the concept. It's, so it's in your head. It's not like a, mm. a perception. I don't think most people would even know that it's a rubber strap. Yeah, or and it's I, like a nice tropic or something. That's quite a... Yeah, a nice tropic. Sort of. If it's got a bit of texture to it, it's not, you know, camouflage. It's not like a, you know, your Oakley Fitbit something. Well, that's the other thing. Watch. Most people are going to be wearing a smartwatch anyway. Yeah, sure. So I don't think it really matters. Yeah, Otherwise... Generally, I, I think I wear a NATO, and that's to Patrick's tr- like point around comfort. For me, a NATO strap is something that I can sort of adjust throughout the day. I can mix it up to give myself some variety. Hundred percent. And it, most again, it, it's low key. Like if you're wearing like a vintage watch or a new watch, it it, it kind of tones it down. Yeah, less blingy than a bracelet. Mm. Oh, definitely. Uh... But otherwise, it's really material. Like I don't own any gold watches at the moment or ever. I don't think. Uh, but that would probably be the other thing I'm cautious of. Is just yeah, you don't want to. It's that old thing of I, I know some guys that they definitely can't have a nicer watch than their boss. Yes, exactly. What about you? Um, yeah, I don't really have any rules. I think it's sort of, uh, you know, again what what Patrick was saying. It's like what, what suits you and what's comfortable. And I, I think for me that's watches. But I guess I do have certain watches that I'll wear for certain things, mm. like. Um, my Nomos is a dressier watch. Like if I feel I have to dress up and it's something that I, you know, if I wear a suit and I'm wearing a tie, I'll, I'll usually lean to that. 
Uh, and certainly if it's, that's my, because it's, I've got a personal, um, you know, one I won't sell. If it's a special occasion, I'll, I'll sort of go to that. Mm. Um, and there's other ones that I'll wear for, you know, I've got the, the, the yellow dialed Halios is sort of my fun casual one. I'm not, not that I won't wear it in yep. any situation, but I will choose based on how I, like where I'm going or what I'm doing around that. But other than that, I mean, I typically will wear something on a fabric strap. Like, yeah, I think it's just my default for comfort and ease of ease of changing them. To be honest, that's it. It adds that variety. I think that the notion of rules with watches is a bit silly, and it goes. It's it's an extension of like fashion and style. It's just it's a silly idea to say no, you can't do this or no, you yes, can't do that. That's a great example of this that uh, that you can probably speak to better than I can. Yeah, it's funny you bring this up. I got a good friend of mine uh, at Jedley One on Instagram. Uh, very one of the world's most um, prominent vintage Rolex well, well, dealers. I don't know if he's prominent, but he's one of the more important. He's ones, very important, you know. He's yeah, but he he likes to wear his watches more or less on a on a NATO strap. He opts for that uh, sort of sub seven dollar cheap NATO strap. Yep, cheap NATO strap. So help help him out. They've got and some he, sales going on. yeah, a few people get shook when he puts a you know a a, a, a Patek, a platinum Patek on a grand comp. Yeah, Grand Comp, low key, Salmon Dial, my Grail watch of all time on yeah. a uh, six ninety nine blue NATO strap, and so I asked him about it. Actually, I said, "Why? Why are you putting this strap on this watch? Is it for the the is it for the shock on Instagram? It's for the Instagram likes. No, I don't, he he honestly he could not care less. But you know, he kind of had a few points around. Well, it depends what it is, when, where, obviously. But you know, often it's security. Uh, when you're traveling through Europe, the gangs there uh, can spot that sort of Rolex bracelet or the, that sort of oyster clasp it's really easily. It's incredibly easy to, to rip it off. The, yeah, exactly. Same with the deployment as well. That yeah, sure. This watch would have come on, I believe, a deployment strap. Yeah. Sometimes it's weight, it's more comfortable. You know, at the moment he says he's washing his hands 25 times per day and he doesn't want to get soap between the links. And, you know, sometimes it's just to troll people on Instagram. Yeah, and I, I think I've spoken to him in the past, maybe not about this one, but he's also... Um not always a big fan of the OEM mm. leather that comes with them. It's like, why, you know, they've spent this much on the watch. Why not spring for a nicer strap? Sort of. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's part of it too. I think it's just a fun thing. Yeah. Good I, for him. I mean, you know, just, just do it. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is not about straps. There's no strap uh, relation to this, but old mate Brad got back to oh, me. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Already? Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah on, the, on the DMs. I mean, he's he was all over it. So he was last episode's watch matchmaker. Yeah, so a quick recap there. He was after a utilitarian, mm. possibly fancy, true GMT, oh, which mm-hmm. we um, we blatantly broke the rules on that one, which is good because in the end he opted for one that wasn't. Are you going to tell me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just pulling up the DMs now. Okay. So What did we lay out for him? It was a... There was a bunch. A couple of Grand Seiko. Yep. Quartz, your one. I put a Brem on. Mm-hmm. Mont Blanc. You did the Fred Constant. And yep. something else. What did I do? Uh, oh, an uh, Omega. 150 oh, meter. Yes, the world. Yes. Yeah, that's a... Yeah. 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 You broke the rules. I broke the rules on the treat budget. Yourself, treat yourself. Yeah. Um, so he's he sort of come back and he said... He, there were some in there he liked that there were some he had never considered. Wow. Or uh, he would, he'd, you know, think about them all, even though the aesthetic range was quite broad. Yep. Who's I'm, he taking on a date, Felix? This is killing me. If you had to pick one, it's a close match between the Grand Seiko GMT, that cream dial is boss, Oof. and the Mont Blanc 1858 Jewel Time, which he hadn't heard about before. Oh, wow. um, but on balance, he'd go for the Mont Blanc because of his preference towards military styling. Okay. He likes the AMPM, the wow, that's a cool, yeah, yeah. and the fact that he can hide the GMT hand underneath the the regular hand. Wow! So, so you, you win this round with a watch he'd never heard of. It's not a competition. I think uh, really the real winner is Brad. Felix, if people want to be like Brad and submit a uh, watch make matchmaker request, what do they do? Well, you, as Brad, you can slide into our DMs, mm-hmm. but it's probably better if you email ot the podcast at gmail Fantastic. Yeah. Anything else to add before we wrap this bad boy out? Uh, thank you for listening. Like yeah. and subscribe. Review us on a platform. Please. Follow us at ot.podcast on Instagram. And thank you to uh, our producer, Major Tom Media. Legend. And thank you, most of all, to Patrick. Yes, fantastic guest, P. Johnson, Taylors. Amazing. Cool. Done. See you later. See you guys.